Hello everybody and welcome to the legal update webinar by the compliance people. I hope you're all having a good day and you're looking forward to learning about the environment and health and safety changes that have taken place over the last year. Before I begin, a few housekeeping areas to address. As this is a webinar, all attendees' cameras and microphones are off automatically and you cannot turn them on. During the session, please use the Q&A button to ask any legal questions you may have about the legislation changes we are covering. You should be able to find that button on the control panel on your screen. Questions asked and answers will be circulated to attendees after the session. Please do be aware that all questions are visible to all attendees. Please use the chat box if you have a technical query and a member of the team will respond and try to help. So we'll be starting off with the environment side of the webinar first, followed by the health and safety updates. So for those of you that have met Ellie previously, you may be wondering why she suddenly sounds a lot more northern today. Unfortunately, Ellie has not been able to make it today due to last minute unforeseen circumstances, but as she has prepared the presentation, we have left this slide in. Um, so just to introduce a little bit about Ellie for those of you that don't know her, she has worked at the compliance people as a consultant for coming up to 10 years now. She delivers lots of kinds of different consultancy support. So this includes a lot of environmental legal compliance audits and also management systems audits. She's worked with a lot of different sectors and clients, and some of you are here today, and you may have also seen her if you've taken part in some of our online virtual training. There's always a lot of changes in environmental legislation, as any LUS subscribers will know when you get the updates to your legal register emailed to you each month. I focused on some key changes from the last year here, and those which I think will be of interest to the widest range of organisations that might be watching this webinar. We'll first be looking at the plastic packaging tax and the introduction of deposit return schemes. Then there's some changes to energy and climate change legislation, updates to building standards. And lastly, we'll be looking at potential upcoming changes in On The Horizon. These are topics currently being consulted on with the government. Let's get straight into it then. The plastic packaging tax was included in last year's webinar when some changes were brought in by the Finance Act, but the actual regulations themselves have since come in. It's a big change in environmental law, so we'd be remiss if we didn't include it in this year's webinar too. The plastic packaging tax general regulations 2022 apply in the UK. The requirements came into force from April 2022. For any LUS subscribers, you will have been alerted to this new piece of law in your March updates last year. If you have the packaging code ticked in the setup of your legal register, you will have these regulations in your environmental legal register. The regulations are intended to encourage the use of recycled plastic instead of new plastic material within plastic packaging. From the 1st of April 2022, anyone who manufactures plastic packaging in the UK or imports plastic packaging into the UK will have compliance duties. So if you make plastic packaging, this definitely applies to you. When we say importing, this includes plastic packaging that is both filled and unfilled. So it might apply where items are purchased in plastic packaging too. For example, if you import plastic bottles filled with drinks or if you have plastic packaging around any goods you are importing. The tax does only apply to plastic packaging with a recycled content of less than 30%, but it's important to note we will still have record keeping requirements, which I will touch on later. There are five key steps to complying with the plastic packaging tax regulations. Number one, firstly, you need to check which of your packaging is covered by the regulations. We'll look at this a bit more on the next slide. Number two, once you've established what is covered, then there are calculations to determine if you will need to register for the tax. This comes down to whether you import or manufacture more than 10 tonnes of packaging that is in scope. And you'll need to also know the percentage of recycled plastic content in the packaging. So there is some calculations you need to do there. There are several methods you can use for working out the weight of a plastic packaging component. And there's detail on this in the guidance. 
For example, there is the sample component method or the verified specification method. For packaging components that include more plastic by weight than any other materials, then it's treated as plastic. Number three, the third thing to do is register for the tax. You have to register for the tax if you manufacture or import 10 tonnes or more of plastic packaging. It's important to note that you do have to register even if you then don't have to pay it because of the packaging's recycled content. Just a note on registering for the tax. We've said that you need to register if you meet the 10 ton threshold, but there are stipulations on how quickly you need to do this. The regulations say that if you expect to import or manufacture 10 or more tonnes in the next 30 days, then you'd need to register. So this means that you'd need to keep a rolling monthly monitor on this. You can't just wait a year to register for the first time you hit 10 tonnes. You must register within 30 days of first becoming liable for the tax. If you are part of a group, you can register as a group of companies. Number four, you have to keep a record of quite a few things, including the calculations you did in step two and of the amount of packaging you're manufacturing and importing, how much tax you are liable to pay, any packaging that you have that you believe is exempt, etc. You should refer to the government guidance for more information on exactly what you need in terms of records, as it's far more than we can go into here. And if you are a LUST subscriber, you can also see the summary on LUST for this legislation. Number five, the most obvious step, make sure that you pay the tax that you've calculated is owed. So looking back at step one, which was to determine which packaging is in scope, the regulations apply to packaging either for use at any part of the supply chain, i.e. to contain, protect, handle, present and deliver goods, or for single use by the consumer, such as plastic bags, bin liners, um, disposable cups, plates and bowls. The key here is to familiarise yourself with what is in and out of scope of the tax to understand if it applies to you. There is a specific document with lots of examples. There are also some exemptions to having to comply with these regulations. Um, examples of exempt packaging includes the immediate packaging of licensed human medicine and packaging used as transport packaging to import multiple goods safely into the UK. Um, for example, the shrink wrap is exempt, but the plastic bag each product is in is not, and plastic packaging used in aircraft, ship and rail goods stores. That's all I'm going to cover on the plastic packaging regulations. It is a detailed topic with an entire suite of guidance published by the government. Hopefully, if you are obligated, you're already on it and complying. But if you're not sure, then do go and read your LUST summary, read the guidance and take whatever steps you then need to. These next regulations only apply to Scotland. They changed the date of the 2020 regulations to give a start date of August 2023. So compliance will be required this year. It was previously intended to start in July 2022. This means that a deposit return scheme will be in place for single use drink containers in Scotland. There are duties for producers and retailers of these products. The scheme is basically where a consumer pays a deposit of 20p when they buy a drink in a single use container and they get this back when they return that container. It applies to containers made of glass, steel, aluminium, or PET plastic in any container between 50 and 3,000 litres that is sealed for sale. So we're talking about drinks, bottles and cans here. Producers, you have to register with SEPA by the 16th of August 2023 and then annuals by March each year. Producers have duties to accept the return of packaging they put on the market, pay the customer the deposit and fulfil minimum collection targets each year. You can do this via a scheme. Retailers have to operate a return point at any premises that markets or sells drinks in the packaging covered. Note that there are some exemptions for certain things like vending machines, so check that out if it does apply to you. It's of note that there has also been a consultation on deposit return schemes run in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, so we can expect similar legislation elsewhere. There's also legislation already in place for Republic of Ireland, the Separate Collection Deposit Return Scheme Regulations 2021. 
but it doesn't have any dates of implementation yet though. Moving on to changes in energy and climate change legislation. The Finance Act 2022 applies in the UK only. We had a change last year where fuel duty, so tax, is also now payable on biodiesel, bioblends and fuel substitutes used for heating. The use of red diesel was also restricted. So red diesel is just diesel which has a much lower rate of tax and it has a dye added so it is red in colour. It's sometimes referred to as um, rebated fuel. So from the 1st of April 2022, you can only use red diesel for specified purposes. So these are vehicles and machinery in the agricultural, horticultural, forestry and fish farming sectors, propelling passenger, freight or maintenance vehicles by rail, heating and electricity generation in non-commercial premises, maintaining community amateur sports clubs and golf courses, machinery used in travelling fairs and circuses and fueling marine craft. So previously it might have been used to power off-road machinery such as bulldozers or cranes in construction but you can't use it for that anymore. So if you used red diesel previously you now should be using just diesel that is taxed at the normal rate like motorists do. It's hoped that the tax system incentivises users of polluting fuels like diesel to improve the energy efficiency of their vehicles and machinery, um, invest in cleaner alternatives or just use less fuel. If the red diesel was put into your equipment prior to the 1st of April 2022 and is being used for the same purpose, then you should be OK. But most likely organisations will have switched to buying diesel now. Here we have another new piece of legislation, the Boiler Upgrade Scheme England and Wales Regulations 2022. This has duties for anyone installing boilers. The regulations give a framework for implementing the Boiler Upgrade Scheme, which aims to facilitate the installation of heat pumps and biomass boilers in domestic and small non-domestic buildings. It will run from the 24th of May 2022 until March 2025. The grant only applies for domestic buildings, but may be of interest to any landlords or businesses with domestic properties. However, it doesn't apply to social landlords. Through the scheme, a grant is available to cover part of the cost of replacing a fossil fuel heating system with a heat pump or a biomass boiler. It applies to those with properties off the gas grid in rural locations. Not going into any more detail, but if you install boilers or have a domestic property in a rural location, then it's worth knowing about. Next, we have some amendments to the building regulations in Scotland. The changes are made to the mandatory standards which set out the requirements for building work. The changes include a change to standard 6.1 and 6.7, which means that from the 1st of February 2023, the design and construction of a building will need to reduce the building's energy demand. Two new standards have been introduced, which ensure a minimum level of electric vehicles infrastructure for both domestic and non-domestic buildings. So this aims to ensure new development and any major renovations have suitable infrastructure to enable charging of electric vehicles. It includes that any non-domestic buildings with more than 10 car parking spaces being newly constructed or undergoing major renovation will need to provide charging for electric vehicles. Um, so I'm sure if you're in construction in Scotland, this isn't news to you, but it's also worth bearing in mind if you are looking at making any major renovations, if your organisation is located in Scotland. Um, we have seen the requirement for electric car charging points in other jurisdictions already, so we'll probably all meet the same standards soon. Moving on to a piece of law that only applies in the Republic of Ireland, we have the Circular Economy and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 2022. There's no direct duties for businesses under this, but you may find secondary legislation. So that's any legislation that follows it may be applicable and we can expect subsequent legislation to be published. So the Act is similar to the Environment Act for the UK for those that are familiar with that. The Act includes information on the strategy to move to a circular economy, the funds to be in place, prohibition on the sale of single use items and a national food waste prevention strategy. It also allows a levy to be imposed on single use items like 
cups, bottles, plastic bags, etc. So you might find things like single use packaging on fruits and vegetables could be banned. As I said, no duties yet, as this is the Act, but you can expect the regulations, um, which will have the duties for businesses and other organisations to follow. So next, we're going to be looking forward to what legislation could we expect to see in the coming months or years. These are not low on loss yet, but are things that could come up in future as changes that are looking at being made or recent consultations that could be of interest. Subscribers will know they get alerted to any new notable consultations each month and can find all consultations with EHS relevance on loss. So firstly, there is a consultation that closed at the end of 2022 that looked at the plans to introduce water efficiency labelling on products that use water. So, for example, taps, showers, toilets, dishwashers, etc. It was asking for opinions on the types of products that would be covered and the associated label and design standards. It looks like this is very much on the way. They are just deciding how to introduce it. So we can expect new legislation about this in the next year or so, I think. I thought it was worth noting that we are now in phase three of ESOS, the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme. Most organisations that are obligated will be familiar with ESOS now. But if your organisation has changed in size in the last year or two, or you've merged or become part of a group, then it's important that you check if you would now be obligated under ESOS. There was a consultation held about ESOS in late 2021. The government has now announced that it intends to introduce legislation to improve the quality of ESOS audits, including using a standardised template for the reports and the requirements to set a target or action plan following the recommendations. Further consultations are expected before they expand the scope of ESOS to include medium sized businesses. Some of the changes are likely to be enabled by the Energy Bill, which was making its way through Parliament in 2022. Following a consultation that ended last year, the government has confirmed it will implement extended producer responsibility from 2024 in relation to packaging. There's legislation that's been in place since 2007, which you'll be familiar with if you are currently classed as an organisation who handles packaging under those regs. Um, i.e. you create, import, distribute or sell. So the government wants to extend that producer responsibility for packaging. Um, so the person putting the packaging on the market is responsible for the cost of its recovery. Organisations that handle packaging are likely to be affected by extended producer responsibility. Um, there is a tool on gov.uk that you can use to determine if you have obligations under the new scheme. So if you think you might be obligated, it's worth having a look. Um, there is a draft piece of legislation in place for England and Wales. So look out for updates on that if you are a LUS subscriber. Legislation has also very recently been published for Northern Ireland and for Scotland on this. So do check these if you handle packaging, as the guidance page still says you'll need to start collecting packaging data from January 2023. In January, there was a press release from the government saying there would be a far reaching ban on single use plastics. So you probably did hear about that in the news. There's nothing in legislation yet, but they have said the ban will be from October 2023 for things like single use plastic plates, bowls, cutlery, etc. So you won't be able to buy those products from any business, including takeaways, restaurants and cafes. So it's similar to the ban that we've already seen for straws and cotton buds, so one to look out for. The other thing I wanted to mention was the new framework for best available techniques, also called BATs in the UK. Some sites with environmental permits, such as those issued by the EA or SEPA, will be required to comply with BATs to allow them to operate their site. So BATs aim to prevent or reduce emissions and impact on the environment. And there are specific documents depending on the industry in which you operate, which determine the types of abatement technologies and methods that should be used. And BATs also form the basis of any emissions limits you may see in your environmental permits. Because we're no longer in the EU where BATs originated from, we needed a process for BATs in the UK. So the outcome is that there's a policy paper on the government website now. 
The EU BATs will continue to have effect, but going forwards there will be a UK BAT system led by the UK, Scottish and Welsh governments and the Northern Ireland Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Any new BATs will be published as statutory instruments and used as a basis for permit conditions. It's expected that the UK system will take one to three years to create its own set of BATs, depending on how complex each industrial sector is. There are technical working groups for each sector, and so we can expect to see UK BATs coming through later this year, I think. So that's just a selection, but if you're a subscriber, we do put all the relevant EHS consultations onto LUS for you. So have a look if there are any specific ones that might affect you. That's it for environment. So I'll now hand over to my colleague Trish, who will let you know the updates for health and safety. Hi everybody and welcome to your yearly legislation update. It's Patricia Parker and I am a consultant with the Compliance People. I've worked with the Compliance People for just over five months now, but have 10 plus years in health and safety, specialising in housing, the care sector and the manufacturing sector. The things that I like to do or uh, specialise in, if you like, are internal auditing of health and safety management systems, health and safety legal compliance audits and delivering health and safety training. And I'll be uh, at also Tone delivering your health and safety updates today. So the agenda we're going to be running through today, we're going to be looking at COVID guidance, our good old friend COVID, the Build and Safety Act 2022, REACH and Chemicals Update, the Road Vehicles Construction and Use Automated Vehicles Order 2022, UKCA and CE Marking and CLP. So let's start off with our good old friend COVID guidance again. So thank goodness, and touch wood in front of me, we seem to be coming out the other side of COVID. Um, the HSC no longer expects every business to consider COVID-19 in their risk assessment or to have specific measures in place, although employers may still choose to continue to cover COVID-19 in their risk assessments. That's going to be a decision for you guys, depending on what you do um, and how much it will affect your business if your workforce were to come down with COVID. There is a requirement to protect those who will come into contact with the virus due to their work activity under the Control of Substance Hazards to Health Regulations 2002 uh, and full guidance is on the gov.uk, HSC and NHS websites. Um, so there are no longer any coronavirus COVID-19 restrictions in the UK. Most people cannot get free COVID-19 tests, although you can still buy tests in shops, but you cannot report the result to the NHS. Guidance, couldn't guidance is if you have COVID-19, you should try to stay at home. Um, but once again, there's nothing to enforce that as we've seen in previous days. You can get vaccinated against COVID-19 by the NHS, but I think actually that's stopping this Saturday or stopped last Saturday. Uh, so you can no longer do that. So on to the Build and Save Safety Act 2022. This act makes groundbreaking reforms to give residents and homeowners more rights, powers and protections so homes across the country are safer. The act is intended to ensure that building safety is a high priority during the life cycle of the building through the implementation of three gateways. Building risks should be considered at each stage of a building's planning and design, construction and pre-occupation stage. So the Building Safety Regulator, that is the HSC and they will oversee and regulate high rise buildings. Duties for the accountable person for the high rise, high risk building. The accountable person could be an organisational business or individual and will have to take reasonable steps to prevent a building safety risk happening. The definition of a building safety risk is the spread of fire or structural failure and they must be able to reduce the series of an accident if one happens and oversee the building post build. They also have specific duties such as need to register existing buildings and new buildings prior to occupation. They need to prepare a safety case report and give it to the regulator on request and apply for a building assessment certificate when directed by the regulator. 
They must also undertake assessment of the building safety risks for all parts of the building for which they are responsible. These must be done on a regular basis or regular intervals. They must also be done whenever something has changed that could make the previous assessment invalid or if told to do so by the regulator, a bit like your normal risk assessment. They must also create a resident engagement strategy. And the main thing that comes through is the, they talk a lot about the golden thread. That's the idea that a golden thread of safety should run through the life cycle of the building, starting from planning, construction, through to post pre-post occupation. We now have REACH and Chemicals Update. So under the European Union with World Act 2018, the EU REACH regulation was brought into UK law on the 1st of January 2021 and is known as UK REACH. REACH and related legislation were replicated in the UK with the changes needed to make it operable in a domestic context. The key principles of the EU REACH regulation were retained in UK REACH. The UK REACH and the EU REACH regulations operate independently from each other and you must ensure you comply with both regulations where necessary. Your business must identify and manage the risks presented by substances you manufacture and place on the market in Great Britain. You must be able to demonstrate how the substance can be used safely and you must communicate the risk management measures to the users. So as an organisation, you will need to consider your role in the supply chain in Great Britain and how you, you use chemicals to determine what your obligations may be. Your previous role under EU REACH may have changed significantly, significantly under UK REACH, so you should review your role. An example of that being previous uh, GB downstream users under EU REACH may now be importers under UK REACH. Under UK REACH, any Great British based legal entity intending to import a substance into Great Britain at or above one tonne per year is required to submit a registration to HSC for that substance. A DUIN or downstream user import notification provides a transitional provision which is put in place to aim to help minimise disruption to your business. Even the two years prior to the 1st of January 2021, you were a downstream user or distributor under EU REACH, or you were regarded as a downstream user by virtue of an only representative agreement. You were able to submit a downstream user import notification before 27th of October 2021. That's 300 days from January 2021. By submitting a DUI, and you effectively defer your registration obligation for two, four or six years, depending on the tonnage band and or hazard profile, beginning after those 300 days. Concerns have been raised by industry about the cost of obtaining the data needed to comply with these transitional provisions. And after consultations, the deadline has been extended by three years to October 2023, October 2025 and October 2027. Okay, now we move on to chemicals. So disocyanates, labelling and training. Disocyanates are used in coatings, adhesives and sealants and are family of chemical building blocks mainly used to make polyurethane products and widely used in the adhesives and sealants industry. They are classified as potential human carcinogens and are known to cause occupational asthma and other lung problems, as well as irritation of the eyes, nose, throat and skin, and have been restricted under REACH. Products sold in the EU and UK with a total monomeric disocyanate concentration greater than 0.1% intended for professional or industrial use must have a statement on the product container labelled by the 24th of Feb 2022, which should be visibly distinct from the rest of the label information. As from the 24th of August 2023, adequate training is required before industrial or professional use of this product, and this must be repeated every five years. Now, substances of high concern. There are three lists, the UK REACH candidate list, the UK REACH authorisation list and the restrictions list. The candidate list 
is a list of substances of very high concern that the HSC are keeping under observation and may in the future be prioritised for inclusion on the authorisations list. The authorisation list is substances of very high concern and once a, substance has, once a substance has been listed, businesses cannot generally use that substance for the specified use beyond a sunset date that is specific for that substance, unless they are granted an authorisation. And then we have the restrictions list, which is a list of substances that cannot be used. So that's just a little recap for you there. So we're now moving on to the Road Vehicles Construction and Use Automated Vehicles Order 2022. So this came into force on the 1st of July 2022 and it amends the Road Vehicles Construction and Use Regulations 1986. The order relates to self-driving vehicles on public roads. A self-driving vehicle is a vehicle that is capable of safely driving itself without human monitoring or control while in automated mode. The aim of the order is to ensure that owners of self-driving vehicles use the technology properly and safely. The amendments also make clear that while a human driver is not responsible for the driving task while the vehicle is operating within this valid self-driving mode, the driver retains all other aspects of the driver responsibility, such as ensuring they are fit to take back control of the vehicle task from the vehicle and ensuring the vehicle is roadworthy. Drivers of automated vehicles are able to view information of any source, including non-driving related information provided. That the vehicle is driving itself and is not requesting the driver to take control and the information is viewed through the vehicle's inbuilt apparatus. Drivers are still not able to use mobile phones. So I'm sure we've all got self-driving vehicles on the road uh, but it's just in case any organizations do have it you just need to be aware that you need to be able to take back control of the vehicle as and when you literally just can't tip back put your feet up and uh, watch your best uh, best netflix series so we now move on to the product safety and compliance amendment regulations 2021 so this is about UK CA or CE marked goods. The UK left the EU single market at 11 p.m. on the 31st of December 2020. The United Kingdom conformity assessed or UK CA mark is being phased in from the 1st of Jan 2021 to replace the CE mark in Great Britain. Although for most goods, the CE mark will remain acceptable for a transitional period ending on 31st December 2024. This has been extended due to COVID. The UK conformity assessed mark is a mandatory mark on a product to indicate that it conforms to GB legislation. The manufacturer or, if mandated, the authorised representative will be responsible for affixing the UK CA mark to the product, which is the same principle as CE marking but for the GB market. UK CA marking applies only in Great Britain comprising England, Scotland and Wales. So it may be helpful to think of it more as a GBCA mark. CE marking continues in Northern Ireland, which remains aligned with the EU single market for goods. So the UK CE conformity mark will replace the CE mark in Great Britain from the 1st of Jan 2023, and UK CA mark goods will not be recognised in the EU market. Okay, as I mentioned before, the uh, UK CE marking is not applicable in Northern Ireland. Uh, if you are using a UK body to carry out mandatory third party conformity assessment, you also need to apply a UK NI marking. You never apply the UK NI marking on its own. It always accompanies an EU conformity marking. Okay. And finally, we move on to CLP. So a unique formula identifier or UFI will soon be required by law on the labels of products classified for health or physical hazards. The 16 digit code is intended to help poison centers to be able to precisely identify the chemicals involved in an accident and provide adequate medical advice. 
The industrial obligation has been introduced by Annex 8 to the CLP regulation, which aligns a European Union system of classification, labelling and packaging of chemical substances and mixtures to the globally harmonised system. The upcoming requirements apply to importers and downstream users who place hazardous mixtures on the market. It will be mandatory to submit notifications with certain product details, such as trade name, product category, composition colour, packaging, toxicological information, as well as a UFI to the appointed body, such as poison centres. Products outside the scope are gases under pressure, mix, mixtures for scientific research and development, and explosives. The CLP regulation annex will enter into force, force as from 1st of Jan 2020. Depending on the product, the following transition periods apply for UFI submissions and labelling. By 1st of Jan 2020, for all new mixtures for use by consumers, which obviously is gone. 1st of Jan 2021, for all new mixtures for professional use, again that's passed. 1st of Jan 2024, for all new mixtures for industrial use. And by 1st of Jan 2025, for mixtures already on the market and notified under national legislation. Okay, so thank you for your time today. Um, if you could uh, fill in the feedback form, please do use the question and answer section to input your questions about any of the updates we've gone through and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. We will address all the questions after the session. So for me and Ellie today, we thank you for your attendance and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.